Welcome back, and um, I wanted to share something with you that occurred, or I received this week, and set up something for you this morning. It'll be a little different than what we generally do. Uh, we've gone through much of Genesis. We've gone through the Exodus, and so forth and so on. <coughs> and um, generally, when I get an anonymous letter, I I, I, I seldom make it out of <coughs> the post office with an anonymous letter because uh, I always have problems with things where a person is, for whatever reason, afraid to identify themselves. Uh, I think that's a, a really um, scary thing that, for whatever reason, you're afraid to, you know, let somebody know who you are. And if you are, generally you shouldn't say anything. But I received this letter, and it's an anonymous letter, dated November the 8th, and I thought I would share it with you because it raised some issues that I think are legitimate. I think the only illegitimate part of this letter is the fact that the person, whoever it is, neglected or, you know, would not sign their name. But uh, let me read the letter to you, and uh, then you kind of be as the jury, and we'll, we'll take a look at it uh, and uh, see what we come up with. Um, the letter goes, it doesn't say, dear anybody, it just says, I ha have now been vindicated in my first impression of your knowledge and therefore of your reliability. Some time ago, you discussed the relationship between pineal, Genesis 32, 31, and pineal as in pineal gland. The biblical word means what the Bible and the Oxford English Dictionary says it means, the face of God. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, pineal comes from the Latin word meaning pine cone because that's what the gland looks like. In other words, pineal and pineal are not linguistically related as you claimed they were. I might point out that the Oxford Dictionary is the single most commonly cited written source among professional linguists. That was my first impression that you didn't know what you were talking about when it came to etymology. Etymology is the derivation of words, where words are derived from. My second impression was formed yesterday when I happened to see the portion of your program on cable TV when you were explaining the origin of the word Israel. You said it comes from Is, Isis, Ra, Ra, and from another Egyptian god and L from a force resulting from the first two. I should have realized right away that you were either lying or speaking from ignorance when you didn't cite any source for your conclusion. Your explanation sounded good. It seemed to fit logically. The only thing is that you were wrong, though I'm not yet sure if you knew that or not. Israel means just what the Bible and the Oxford Dictionary says it means, he who strives with God. And the Oxford Dictionary, which always traces the origins of the word, does not say one single thing about Israel being formed linguistically from two Egyptian deities. After having spoken with a linguist I know, I was confirmed in my conclusion that if the Oxford Dictionary says nothing about an Egyptian deity source for Israel, then there is no Egyptian deity source. What was your source for the conclusion you reached? If you came to your own conclusions, then just what linguistic training have you had? Obviously, you either don't know what you're talking about and are hoping to bluff your way along, or you're deliberately lying for some ulterior purpose. The only people being taken in by your misinformation are the people who are too lazy or too intimidated to check out your so-called facts. As far as these words are concerned, that is, the relationships you said existed between them, I challenge you to find any professional, nationally recognized linguist who will go on record and state unequivocally that Peniel and Pineal are etymolo etymologically related, and that the Oxford Dictionary internationally recognizes the most thorough and most prestigious and reliable lexicon ever produced is wrong. This also goes for the origin of the word Israel. Of course, you won't do any such thing because you know that would damage your credibility with the poor suckers you're trying to con, because you've had to admit that you didn't know what you were talking about. I don't sign my name because I don't wish to have it broadcast on the air, and I don't want to initiate a correspondence. I simply sign myself someone who's on to you. Okay. Hey, you know, but on the other hand, he raises situation. You know, if he had only signed his name, then the letter would carry, you know, a great deal of credibility with it. Uh, I think when <coughs> you get into defining origins of words and you have to depend on the Oxford English Dictionary to talk about the origin of mystical language that comes out of Egypt, it's, it's somewhat difficult. Um, Hilton Hotima, who is a, a noted metaphysical scholar, um, came up with the idea that Israel came from the fact that Ezra actually had rewritten the first five books of the Bible. And the word Ezra 
it, Egyptian is also pronounced Isra. And so then what Hilton, Hilton <laughs> felt was that what Ezra had done was to give Jacob his name and then attached El to God to it. But that wouldn't change the problem. The problem still exists. Where does Isra come from? Why does Ezra or Isra have that name? <coughs> so, so the problem still exists there. Um, Helena Blavatsky uh, saw basically the sun god as I-S-A-R-U-L, I believe. I'm not exactly who sure had, she had pronounced it. Uh, no, it was R-A-L. But once again, the problem is still there. Uh, I, S, and R, A, and L show up, and here E, L shows up there. So you really have to look at the letter again, and if you'll notice, the person who wrote the letter said that the, um, if the Oxford says nothing about an Egyptian deity source for Israel, then there is no Egyptian deity source. But that doesn't change the fact, then, where does the letter or the word Israel come from? What is its origin? If the Oxford Dictionary doesn't say it's, it's, it's of Egyptian choice, but it doesn't say it's not. It doesn't say anything. And so we're left then looking again at that word, okay? Um, if I was to stand back and say to you, I see in the word Israel three Egyptian gods. I don't have to be an ophthalmologist, I don't have to be uh, linguistically, you know, schooled. I'd simply have to be able to see. Uh, this is Isis. There is a god, the queen heaven, queen mother of Egypt named Isis. You can see that in the word Israel. It's there. The father god is named Ra, who is the father, the mind, and you can see the name Ra in that word. El is a god, now he said two gods, there's three. El is a god that comes from the Mithra bull cult and portrays the inner power of God. So you have th the names of three gods contained in that word. So I don't really think you have to be, a, you know, I, I accused or, 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 or really trying to con people. You say, gee, look at that. I think for all of you who have ever come here, the one thing I've always told you, I said, you're not really supposed to believe anything. I'm just sharing things with you and presenting ideas to you. The word Israel contains the name of these three Egyptian gods. Now, there's a very interesting thing. In the Muslim religion, the person who is to blow the last trumpet, I think we say it's Gabriel. In, the, in Muslim religion, it's Israel will blow the last trumpet. Isra fell. Okay. So the point of the letter that I'm concerned about is that the Oxford Dictionary that he speaks of does not come up with an idea of where did the word Israel come from. It had to come from somewhere. There's a reason why this word exists. Where does it come from? So he doesn't tell us where it comes from, and the Oxford Dictionary doesn't tell us where it comes from. But he says there's no deity connection. Say. Now, this all starts on page 28 in those little Bibles you have in Genesis chapter 32. And in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28, it says, And your name shall be no more Jacob but Israel, for as a prince you have power with God, and with men, and you have prevailed. Okay. So it means to strive with God. So the writer, whoever wrote this letter, is right. That's what the word means. But let me tell you something. Uh, I looked up the word amen, and it means so be it. Mm -hmm. or, the end. or the end. But it's the name of the Egyptian sun god, Amen Ra, same guy. I looked up the word gay in the, in the New Funk and Wagnalls International Collegiate Barbaric Dictionary, whatever these things are, and it said to be jolly and happy and uh, all this type of stuff. It didn't say anything about homosexual, you know. But anyhow, 
we look at the origin of things and now we're starting to look into the metaphysical things, we're looking into the mystical things, and we come up with this. So what a word means in English is not necessarily what it means in another language. And, and, and you run into these types of things. For instance, the word muscle. The word muscle, you know what the word muscle means, you know, and that's something that makes you very strong. And it comes from the Latin musculus, M-U-S-C-U-L-S, which means little mouse. So there's no, there's no connection whatsoever. How could you ever say that this comes from the word musculus? Well, the word musculus means little mouse, and muscle means big, strong person. But that's where it comes from. Right. And so, you know, it becomes an interesting thing. Uh, when we look at things like this and we start to get into the point and say, I'm going to open the Oxford Dictionary and come up with the, with the meaning of these things, there's a point that you're missing. And I want you to look at it. Look at Proverbs chapter 1 uh, on page 541. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6. Okay. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 6. And it's talking about wisdom. And how does it define wisdom? In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6, it says, To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The dark sayings are sayings you're not going to find in the Oxford Dictionary. You're not going to find in Webster's Dictionary. They're not written in there. The one place where they did contain them was in a, was in a, dic it was in a library in Alexandria, Egypt, and the first thing that the Christian religion did when they became a powerful force was to burn that place down. And that's where most of this was, was located, okay? The origin of, of these mystical things. Look also on page 502 in, in the book of Psalms, and Psalm 78, and, and see what it says. In Psalm 78, and verse 2, what does it say? I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Dark sayings of old are not necessarily going to be found in any type of an English dictionary or any type of a dictionary that exists, see? So, what's the point? The gentleman says there is no Egyptian deity involved in, in this word. Where did the word come from? Where was the word uttered? The word was uttered in the book of Genesis. The thesis about the book of Genesis, or the idea of the book of Genesis, is that it is contained within the first five books of the Bible and is alleged to have been authored by Moses. So then if that's the case, the word first was spoken or first was written by Moses. I want you to go to page 894. And page 894, you get to um, the Acts of the Apostles. And look at Acts chapter 7. And let's see what it says about Moses. And, and he was the first one then to utter, if this is the case, if there was such a person as Moses, he was the first one to utter the word Israel. Okay, And it says in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, what does it say about Moses? Moses, according to the Bible, is the one who wrote the first five books. Moses, according to the, what we understand from history, is the one who wrote the book of Genesis. Moses then would be the first one who ever put on paper or ever uttered the word Israel. And what does it say in Acts chapter 7, verse 22? And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Egyptians. It doesn't say he was learned in all the wisdom of the Jews. It doesn't say he was learned in all the wisdom of the Oxford English Dictionary. It says he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he changed, or whatever, gave the name Israel. Israel. If I say to you, there are three prominent Egyptian gods. One is Isis. Do you see it anywhere in that name? The other is Ra. Do you see it anywhere in that name? The other is El. Do you see it anywhere in that name? Do you have to be a linguist or do you have to have a copy of the Oxford Dictionary in order to see Isis, Ra, and El in that name? I wouldn't think so. I'll tell you something else that I've said that nobody else has said. I have said that Adam is atom. I've never seen an Oxford Dictionary that will say to you that the word Adam comes from atom, but it does. And that's what taking a rib out of Adam means you're splitting the atom. That's not in the Oxford Dictionary. You don't have to believe that. I can't prove that. I'm offering that to you. 
There's 10,000 different variations. But what I am saying to you is that I am seeing this word, and I find in this word that is a Jewish word that hails the Jewish nation, very strange that it does contain... And this is proved because you have eyes. If you can see this board, it contains the name of these three gods. And it goes to such an extent that if you go into the deep mythology, you'll find that these two were married. The queen of heaven married the sun god. And they produced El, which is the power within you. Right. And if really you are seeking to understand who this is in the form of what you use as contemporary religion, and most of you have gone through Christianity, this is Mary, this is God the Father, and this is Jesus. That's okay, no problem with that. And if you want to take it inside of yourself, this is the pituitary gland, this is the pineal gland, and this is you. It is the feminine and it is the masculine and it produces a harmony that makes a power within. And that's what Israel means. Sorry. But where does the word come from? He said there's no connection with an Egyptian deity. Then why does it contain the name of the three most prominent Egyptian gods? And why is it first uttered by a man who is learned in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians? So, I suggest you believe nothing. But don't be afraid to express yourself. I see it curious that the name Israel contains these three prominent Egyptian gods. And it, it must mean something occult. Now, let, let us say something here. If I am talking about these three prominent Egyptian gods and then attributing it to the spirit mind working in harmony which produces the power within you. And of course that word E-L is the god Mithra of the uh, uh, L from the god Mithra bull cult. Which, in fact, if you ever look in ancient books of mythology, you'll see the god L sitting on a throne and he has a bull mask with horns on his head. Okay? That power inside L is the origin in English of the word angel. And so all of the angels have the name that ends in L, Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, Uriel, Ariel, all of that stuff, because that's... And the reason that they end in L, and that's not going to be in the Oxford Dictionary either, is because of the bull Mithra cult, which was the power which explodes within the power of God, from within. Okay. Now... When we talk about this being a connection of body and mind and not being country or race of people, we have to look and go a little bit further. And I'll show you something interesting. Look at page 920. And in the book of Romans, page 920, and in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 2, okay, verse 20. Nine. And in verse 28, the Apostle Paul says, He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Verse 29, He is a Jew which is one inwardly. So then the Apostle Paul is saying, Jewishness, Israeliteness, has to do with an inward change, an inward identification. So it has to do, if it's inward, it has to do with consciousness, it has to do with spirit and mind. What about the word Jerusalem? What about Jerusalem? Jerusalem is the holy city, isn't it? And you know Jerusalem ever since you've ever heard of it, it's been anything but a holy city. It's a violent place. It's, to this day, it's a very violent place. Okay. Are we talking about Jerusalem? When you make a trip to the Holy Land and you go to a travel agency, you're going to make a trip to the Holy Land, you're going to go to Jerusalem. But you should make a trip to the Holy Land and you should go to Jerusalem without ever leaving your, your house, without ever leaving your chair. Because Jerusalem is not expressing any identity of the Jerusalem that exists in the Middle East. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go to page 953. Look at the book of Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 4, 20, 
5. 424. The Apostle Paul says, which things are an allegory? Verse 25. Agar answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage. That's the physical Jerusalem which is in the Middle East. But look at the next verse, verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free and is the mother of us all. So it's a mystical Jerusalem, and Israel is a mystical thing, and Isis is mystical, and Ra is mystical, and El is mystical, and Israel is mystical. And you see no connection with the deity. The man says, there is no connection with the Egyptian deity. Did he say? Look what he says in this letter. He says, there is no connection with the Egyptian deities. I spoke to my friend who's a linguist, and he says, if the O-E-D, the I Oxford doesn't say anything about then there is no Egyptian deity source. But I want you to look on page 778 of the Bible in the book of Matthew and look about Jesus. And what does it say about Jesus? Matthew chapter 2, okay, page 778. And I want you to look at this because you're the jury here and you have to reach a conclusion. Say. And you can reach any conclusion you want. And you can say, oh, Israel doesn't mean what you say it does. But then be prepared to tell me what it means. Say. And then be prepared to tell me why you have the names of three prominent Egyptian gods making up that name. And then when you tell me there is no connection with an Egyptian deity, explain this to me. Matthew chapter 2, verse 14 Joseph arises, takes the young child and his mother, departs into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Not out of England, not out of Borneo, not out of Pittsburgh or Fork and River, not out of Chicago, out of Egypt. There's a connection. There's a connection in the deity of Jesus Christ in Egypt because it says so in the Bible. And there was a connection between this word and Egypt because the one who is supposed to have written these words was versed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was not versed in all the wisdom of England. He was not versed in all the wisdom of, of, of America. He was versed in all the wisdom in Egyptian. And then... And then on top of all this, I ask you to look finally at page 1004 in the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, page 1004, I ask you to look on page, on Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Here is the same Jesus Christ who fulfills the prophecy by coming out of Egypt, which means there's a connection, the connection between the Jewish and Christian deity and Egypt, and then has the audacity in verse 14 to say, these things saith the Amen. Amen, which is the name of the Egyptian sun god. Amen, Ra. And there's an Egyptian connection. So, I think there was two things that were improper about his letter. Number one, he didn't sign, or she didn't sign the name, whoever it was, did not sign their name. And number two, they did not tell us then where did the word come from. They just says it doesn't come from here. Sorry. But I, I leave you saying this one thing. Okay, and the point is, Israel comes out of the mouth or the pen of somebody who is learned and versed in the words of the Egyptians and contains the name of the three prominent Egyptian gods, Isis, Ra, and El. You, you want to say? Yeah, I wanted to ask you. Uh, El is also the beginning of Elohim, which is the word for God that's used in the first chapter of Genesis and the first three or four verses of the second chapter. Right. But after that, it becomes uh, Jehovah. Okay. So that's where it's used in that part. And I'm wondering if there's a connection with that, too. Elohim makes sense. Oh, I, I, there's no doubt that, that exactly that's exactly what it is. And uh, yet... Pre, even predate you have to go you have to predate even that and you have to pre predate the Bible to go into that bull Mithra cult and, and you look and you see the origin very interesting if you especially look up in, in uh, books of mythology or whatever and look at that L and look at the bull, bull Mithra cult it's a very interesting to, thing too that in that bull Mithra cult Mithra is um, born on December the 25th is crucified is uh, buried and then resurrects 
in the spring at the early morning and the priests of the bull Mithra cult uh, uh, run around the tomb and shout, oh, here, glorious Savior who has saved us from our sins, rise on this beautiful morning for by your shed blood we have salvation. It's a very, very interesting thing. And that is the origin of it. And of course, that word El finds its way into Elohim, which is the plural of God, and uh, finds its way into this word Israel. Okay, So I leave that as it is, and as far as the point here, I would make one last point, and I don't do it with any kind of uh, brashness or anything, but I would make this point because the man says here, or the person, I'm saying it, what was your source for the conclusion? If you came to your own conclusions, just what linguistic training have you had? I, I would wish that you would look at this with me. Go to page 996, and I will share my training with you and uh, you can reach a conclusion on your own. Page uh, 996 in 1 John chapter 2, since we are looking in the Bible for all of this type of authority. This is the authority and the linguistic training I have had. The anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as has, has taught you, you shall abide in him. That's where my authority has come from. And uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Okay? And, you know, uh, I, I, I really don't think that this is a big a deal because the point simply was made that it, that name contains those three words. You wanted to say something. You want to stand up so that people can say? Yeah, and, and get that close to your mouth because it won't... Um. All, all I wanted to say to you was, um, first of all, it's very funny. You put power and E-L and electric <laughs> into mine. That's good. But That's anyway, good. that wasn't my question. Or the electric eel. <laughs> I'll get you too. E-L, I'll shock you. You've got to hold that up or they can't hear you. You can hear me. Not, no, they can't. They can't. My question was, what, is, what does Gaskill say about it? What does Gaskill say about Israel? Nothing. Nothing at all? No. Oh, very interesting. Nothing. Um, there's, there is a, a variety of different ideas. Uh, Blavatsky says it's, it's, it's the Egyptian sun god, but she uses a, a name that I've never seen before, Israral. Uh, the Muslims use Israfel. Uh, Hilton Hotima believes it's uh, maybe it's Isra, who was Ezra, but that doesn't change the fact of where's Isra come from. And it doesn't change the fact in Blavatsky's using the name of the sun god. Why is the sun god called Israel? I mean, the point is nobody identifies the fact of where does IS and RA come from. To me, what is interesting and can't be denied is that the word contains the name of three Egyptian gods. It's just that, you know. So that's the point. Okay? Anybody else? All right, you have to come on up or just stand up uh, so that, uh, and, and, and when you make, uh, please put the microphone close up to um, your, your mouth so that. Uh, Hold it straight to the mouth. I have several comments. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I find it extremely belligerent and ignorant of this individual to call us lazy people that we do not do our research. I find that, that this individual is extremely, extremely ignorant to say that about us, number one. We, as people, do not go around criticizing other religions. I have just recently done some traveling with my daughter and my husband. On the way back from Hilton Head, South Carolina, we stopped into the Casey Museum. At the Casey Museum, I picked up a book for a child for six bucks called What is God? In this book, and I wish she'd brought it today with her because she had it packed and left it at home, it goes on to talk about the different religions and how we all have a different path to where we want to go. And if we all agree upon that, which I think almost everybody does, the Jews, the Arabs, whoever, okay? We each have our own book, the Holy Bible, the Torah, whatever it may be. And this is what this book that I just bought for her teaches her. Um, if we all agree upon this, then why do we get this kind of crap mail? That's what I want to know. Why do we get this? That's what I want to know. We're one big universe. In this book that I bought for her, it teaches that if you just close your eyes, if you really want to know what is God, 
And if you just close your eyes and think about it, how we are all connected, how Jillian is connected to my husband, how they're connected to me, how in all actuality I'm connected to my brother, my mother. Think about it. We're one big universe, and we are all connected in one force that is so powerful that we are just a little piece of it. And in the end, what it actually said is that everything is God. Everything, because the whole universe is everything. It's eternal, and it's everything. So if everything is God, meaning the trees and the leaves and you and I, then who is God? We are. And who is he to criticize? And who is he to say to me that I don't know what I'm doing because I'm sitting on my duff because I'm too lazy to look this up? That angers me. That angers me that he has the nerve to do that. I haven't criticized he, pardon me, she, whoever. <laughs> I have not criticized this individual. I don't go around criticizing people for what their beliefs are. They're on a different level than I am. And that's the way I look at it. Exactly. They're on a different level than I am. And I'm not going to let it bother me. So okay. 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 Thank you. you. Okay. Now. Uh, all the way in the, can you, in, can you throw the light on in the back? Would, would you stand up, Alan, wait till she gets back there with the, uh, back here. all right. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, no. No, not now. That's all it. All right, now I can hear it better. <laughs> you can hear it better. You know, I've come to this uh, church yeah, because I was in a lot of pain uh, to, well, I guess, sitting here from my higher power. But, uh, you know, I've learned in this church also that people are entitled to their own opinion and that I don't have to necessarily entertain that opinion. Uh, I'm, I don't have everything knocked. You know, I'm not, I haven't heard voices. Would you say there is no such thing as voices? I come to this church because I need this church. And let people, I, I've learned, I'm learning to let people do their own thing and let my higher power direct me where I need to be. So people can write all the letters they want and it's, if I get excited about it, well, that's, that's my responsibility. Uh, but if they, you know, if they answer, the, if I get a case to answer, like you're doing, to come yeah. up and stuff I've heard before in the church, as you've done uh, a definition of the, of the word or what it's all involved. But, uh, you know, it's like the spirit. I want the spirit, not the letter. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hear a lot of, you know, I hear a lot of good things in this church. That's why I come back. And this guy that writes, I don't get excited about this guy. And I wouldn't waste so much time. I don't waste time on people getting into a head case. I got to keep it simple for me because I'm a complicated guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Real quick, because I got one more answer to go here. Hey, we're just getting into it now. <laughs> I like what you said about the spirit as opposed to the letter. Yeah. Because Hold God. It up, Hold it up. God cannot be explained, and he can't be understood. He can only be experienced. I liken it to, to a person who is blind from birth. You can spend your whole life explaining to them what light is, what it does, but until that person experiences light, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. So you can explain God and read every book and talk to everyone in the world, but until you experience it, it means nothing. Okay. Let me... Uh, uh, when you get back in here, I want to turn that rear light off there. But let me do one other because he raised the question and said there was no connection. And we're going to have a, I need a couple of witnesses here <laughs> to talk of pineal and pineal. And, you know, okay, it, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, the pineal gland is indeed a gland, and the word pineal means face of God. And this comes from Latin, and it's pine cone. And he was absolutely right when he said that. Um, but if you look in Webster, it also brings something strange in, in the uh, definition of pineal gland. It says, ancient times known as the single eye, third eye, or seat of the soul. So <laughs> that means that there was somebody in ancient times who was considering this particular gland as some type of instrument of the soul. Now, when then I hear this single eye, I then have to run to the Bible. And on page 781 in the Bible, Jesus makes a statement, and he says, if your eye be single, 
your body will fill with light. Okay? So, so what we do here, and what I like to do in, in looking at these things, is by a process of, of, of looking at different, different writings and, and different sources, try to see if we can reach some conclusions. Uh, <laughs> if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Well, if Webster says that the pineal gland was known to the ancients as the single eye, your body will fill with light, now we understand that this pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, which is a skin lightener. What's well, interesting? And it gives a little bit of credibility to the fact that this pineal gland is, is more than just a pine cone in the middle of the brain. You know, I mean, it, 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 it has, to, has to have some, you know, relevance to it. Now, in Genesis 3230, if you, if you look on page 29, you, you'll see what's being talked about here. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 30. Jacob calls the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Okay, so... We have to now, all we have is this book. So now we have to start doing a little research. We have to look for some witnesses. We have to try to get some credible witnesses and, and, and get some credible facts about this thing uh, and, and, and see about this, you know, seeing God's face, meaning pineal. Did he act? Look, go to page 864 in the Bible and look at John 1. It's the same book. Okay, this is what I do all the time. And this is the way... I tried to present these things to you with as, as much documentation and credibility as I can muster. But if I look at John chapter 1, now remember, pineal means to see God's face, and he calls the word pineal because he has seen God face to face. In John chapter 1, look at verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. No man has seen God at any time. So if you're going to say, I saw God's face, this guy says, no, the Bible, the same Bible says, no, that's not possible. Nobody has seen God in it, yet he saw God's face. Now, let me just show you one other thing. Go to page 77 in the Bible, and uh, look at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. And this is God speaking to Moses. And look what he says. Verse 20, and God says to Moses, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Oh, so now we have John saying no man has ever seen God, and here's God himself saying, you cannot see my face, no man can see my face and live. So he didn't really see God's face. But the word face then takes on a symbolic meaning, and, and, the, and the whole business takes on a symbolic Jacob calls the place Peniel, for he's seen God's face, or whatever it was, saw God's face, in an inner mystical way, not in a physical way, because we have two testimonies here, by John who says you cannot see God's face physically, and by God himself who says no man can see my face. In fact, it goes on in the Bible in Exodus to say, Moses said, God said to Moses, look Moses, you hide in the rock, in the cleft of the rock, and I'll walk by and you can see my back, but you can't see my face. Okay? So now, what did Jesus say? If your eye be single, if you touch this pineal gland, your body will fill with light. Okay? I want you to look at page 995. Remember now, in Peniel, Jacob said he saw God. In Matthew, the single eye, Jesus says, your body will fill with light. I want you to look on page 995. Look at 1 John, okay? And look at 1 John chapter 1, and look at verse 5. And what does it say? God is light. If your eye be single, if you stimulate the pineal, your body will fill with light. God is light. So now I'm starting to see a connection. Because this guy saw God, but so you cannot see God's face physically. He must have had a mystical experience. So his experience was an experience of light. And 
It says God is light. And so then I would say, well, now that shows me some connection here that the pineal being discussed as the pine cone and the pineal are one and the same. As they say, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. But I need, I need, I need some, I need you as the jury to allow me to bring you some witnesses. Let me bring you the man who, or the person who wrote this, and said, according, you have a relationship between the pineal gland and the pineal gland. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, Eve, <laughs> according to the Oxford English Dictionary, pineal comes from the Latin word meaning pine cone. Okay? And that's true. He or she or it is right. That's true. Okay? <laughs> Will you listen to me, please? E.A. Wallace Burge, who is one of the most preeminent mystical whatever, exp you know, guys who go into Egypt and explore all of this stuff. Listen to what he says. E.A. Wallace Burge has noted that in the papyrus illustrating the entrance of the souls of the dead, into the judgment hall of Osiris, the deceased person has a pine cone attached to the crown of his head. Wow. Let me repeat. And a little round of applause for E.A. Wallace Burge, uh, <laughs> whoever he is. I'm sure he's from good old Mother England, too. E.A. E. Wallace Burge has noted that in the papyrus illustrating the entrance of the souls of the dead into the judgment hall of Osiris, the deceased person has a pine cone attached to the crown of his head. The Greek mystics also carried a symbolic staff, the upper end being in the form of a pine cone, which is called the thyrsus of Bacchus. In the human brain, there is a tiny gland called the pineal body, which is the sacred eye of the ancients and corresponds to the third eye of the cyclops. Now, just, just one second. So I need also to um, introduce a witness. This man had a witness, this woman, whatever, had a witness, the Oxford English Dictionary. And I would offer to you, as ladies and gentlemen of the jury, a witness. now when a witness comes to testify, that witness has to have credibility. That witness has to have credentials. That witness has to be an ex I'm calling an expert witness. Okay, I offer to you as an expert witness, and I will give his credentials. The gentleman's name is Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes. I, Rene, not you, but Rene. Well, Descartes, Descartes, whatever. That's his name. I would like to give you his credentials. Listen carefully, because you have to allow him to be a witness on behalf of this thing, this argument. René Descartes, Descartes stands at the head of the French School of Philosophy and shares with Sir Francis Bacon the honor of founding the systems of modern science and philosophy. Pretty good. As Bacon based his conclusions upon observations of external things, Descartes founded his metaphysical philosophy upon observations of internal things. The philosophy of Descartes first eliminates all things and then replaces as fundamental those premises without which existence is impossible. Descartes defined an idea as that which fills the mind when we conceive a thing. The truth of an idea must be determined by the criteria of the clarity and distinctness. Hence, Descartes held that a clear and distinct eye must be, idea must be true. Descartes has the distinction also of evolving his own philosophy without recourse to authority. Consequently, his conclusions are built up from the simplest of premise and grow in complexity as the structure of his philosophy takes form. I offer to you as a jury his credentials as one who has the honor with Sir Francis Bacon of founding the systems of modern science and philosophy. 
Therefore, would you allow a man with this kind of credentials who founded modern science and philosophy to speak as a witness on my behalf? I will quote René Descartes. Quote, in man, soul, and body touch each other only at one single point, the pineal gland in the brain. And I am quite prepared to submit this into evidence. Do you want to stand up so uh, he can get a shot? There's an even simpler explanation that he is overlooking. The Old Testament of the Bible was written in um, Hebrew. In Hebrew, there are no vowels. So when they translated from the Hebrew to English, they put in whatever vowels they chose to, E-A-L, I-E-L. And but don't argue with her, wise guy, because she <laughs> is the teacher, and she knows what she's talking about. So it could simply be a matter of translation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I think the point, however, when we, when we look at the fact that pineal was considered the single eye, Jesus mentions the single eye, that God is light and that pineal sees God, who cannot be seen physically, means it has to be inside of the mind or in the brain. That the word indeed does mean pine cone. But what have we established? We've established a connection between the ancients' idea of pineal and pine cone because as they entered into the hall of Osiris, a dead person, they put a pine cone on its head. So there's a definite connection between pine cone and pineal, and that's what this person said. There was no, oh, pineal means pine cone, this means face of God. But the pine cone was here. And then we wrap it up by, I think, a man who may even have better credentials than me or the anonymous <laughs> letter person, writer. letter writer, René Descartes, who says, in man, soul and body touch each other only at one single point, the pineal gland of the brain, Descartes. So, you know, I think we've answered those things, and I think the point that I wanted to raise with you is the fact that he may not be alone. It's, sometimes you think somebody's, well, you know, where you're coming up with this stuff. And I wanted to let you see that, you know, all of this stuff, I mean, I don't see anybody can prove anything that's in ancient documents. But we try to by a process of documentation and elimination and by looking kind of deep into everything that we can find, try to get as close to truth as we're able to. And um, I think you, you would say that we've made, you know, reasonable cases. Once again, Israel contains the names of three Egyptian gods. Well, it does. And that's the way it is. And I think we've made the case for Pineal. Oh, excuse me, please. I have one other witness to call. They just rushed in the door. <laughs> My God, I forgot this. I do have one other witness to call. Uh, in, in fact, um, God, why did you uh, let me... Um, get to this uh, point. Uh, yes. Um, oh, God. I, I, evidently, I didn't read. But there is the Kabbalah, which is the book of the, the ancient Jewish mystics, who say, above the eye is no eyelid, neither is there an eyebrow above it. The eye is never closed. There are two covered into one. All is right. There is no left. He slumbers not and requires not protection. And the reference being merged. And then, of course, from Vishnu, the Hindus, the wise, ever beheld the highest step of Vishnu, fixed like an eye in heaven, which is that, which is that third eye. There was also, and I had thought that I brought it with me, and it, I probably forgot to uh, underline it, but a book out of the uh, ancient Greek teachings of Hippolytus, H-I-P-P-O-L-Y-T-U-S, which talks specifically about the uh, pineal gland of the brain being the mystical carrier of that which is God. And I wanted to bring that as a second witness, and I don't know what I did with it. But anyhow, you'll have to uh, let that one ride. I got so excited about Rene when I found Rene, you know, I, you know the rest of the stuff went out the window. You know, <laughs> it's really something. Because, in fact, I'm working on, uh, for Tom Lepresti uh, on uh, the uh, steeple, the origin of the steeple oh, as the um, <laughs> male sexual organ at, an, uh, at attention, you know, and uh, uh, 
And it's and what I'm coming, you know, I'm just seeing finally so many stuff, and I got a lot of it put together, but I want to be able to hand him the stuff that he can use. Um, that is very interesting of, of how, you know, in the ancient times, the ancient temples were constructed in the form of the human body. Uh, and uh, the head, the heart, and so forth. And I mean, even today, in the present day, your church where the, where the congregation sits is called the nave, the navel. And the, the altar being the head of the church, and, you know, what we're talking about being the other thing. But um, it's, it's, you see, and, and the point is, we go into shock uh, at these types of things, but those people, and, and, and this was very holy to them, the origin of life. Uh, that was Genesis, genitals, all that kind of stuff. It's, all, it, it's the origin of life. And it was, the Bible is not to be interpreted materially, but spiritually. That's right, absolutely. But, you know, it's difficult to do because here, here you have the fellow that wrote the letter, and you know, he's very dependent on, on the letter and linguistics and so forth and so on. And... Um, you get into this kind of stuff, it, it, it defies that. Let's do uh, real quick because we're running late. The uh, medita Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, I, th wait a minute. I didn't say good, uh, goodbye. Uh, th go ahead and make the comment. Stand up, make the comment. Stand up. It has, really, it has to do with meditation. Well, stand up, make the comment. I just, I just read in the paper this morning that um, um, Trump is having all of his employees work in meditation. Fantastic. Well, good. Wow. Donald, uh, center light, center light. Here, let me have a go down. Huh? Uh, the Trump, I don't know what paper it is. Yes. I, I think uh, referring to the author of this letter that we should all kind of feel happy for them because like all of us at one time, I think they're starting to turn away from mainstream religion and starting to see things for their own understanding and I think that's good for them. Sure. Thank you very much. I think that's important too um, that everything.